technologically feasible. Okay, also Easter Sunday, Easter breakfast, 9 o'clock to 10.30, right? 9 o'clock to 10.30. Easter egg hunt is going on. What, about what time? About 10 o'clock, Easter egg hunt. So I want to be part of that. And the Easter flower cross is returning. So it's a little, it's just a little early, but if you got things blooming, bring them. Bring them. Easter flower cross. Okay. Now today, Palm Sunday, in just a few minutes, we will take our palm branches and process into the sanctuary for the rest of the service. And as we begin processing, and Gary leads, leads us, You'll hear the organ begin playing, and then once enough of us are in the sanctuary, we'll begin to sing all glory, laud, and honor. On your way into the sanctuary, pick up a little booklet that has the text of today's gospel. The gospel is Mark 14 and 15 in dramatic reading form. You will need one because this is an audience participation gospel. So make sure you pick one up on the way in. Okay, let's take just a minute to share the peace of the Lord with each other. Lord's peace, Gary, and thank you. Two more, two more things before we begin. One is, as we begin the procession, um, it's going to go out this way. So please make room for Gary. And also, once we're inside, the choir is going to sing. So if the choir is moving out, don't block them. Okay, let them, <laughs> let them get there. Okay. And secondly, speaking of choir, I forgot to mention, 8:30 Easter Sunday service, we will be singing the Hallelujah chorus. Anybody who's sung it before and wants to join in, stay after worship today for a brief practice. That's Hallelujah Chorus. Okay, we begin. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Now please repeat after me. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna to the Son of David. Let us pray. Most merciful God, as the people of Jerusalem, with palms in their hands, gathered to greet your dearly beloved Son when he came into his holy city, grant that we may ever hail him as our King, and when he comes again, may go forth to meet him with trusting and steadfast hearts, and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to John, the 12th chapter. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Now let us go forth 
in peace in the name of the Lord.
to see who comes in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. As the crowds welcome you, Lord, with palm branches, as we celebrate you today with palms and hands, may we always welcome you into our lives each day, following your example in humility and trusting in your saving love. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. 
Lord, we do celebrate that you came to ride on in majesty. But we also celebrate that you rode on in majesty to die. That those shouts of Hosanna too soon became cries of crucify. And so soon, our lives here, giving you our praise and our time and singing Hosanna to your glory, so soon, in thought, word, and deed, we will sin and fall short. But it was for these sins that you came. It was for the atonement that we need and the forgiveness upon which we depend. So we praise you, Lord, that you came to ride on to die for us. And we pray, Lord, that now as our attention in worship shifts from palm branches to the cross, you make us ever mindful of your love and what your love led you to do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite our children's church leaders for today. For our children's church leaders. There we are. Okay. And then children who are going to children's church today, now is the time. Out that way. May God bless each one of you and his word. Okay. Today's first reading is written in the second chapter of Philippians, beginning with verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Grace and peace in Jesus. This past week, Teresa and I are out for a hamburger, a local hamburger place nearby. You can guess which one. And I saw there on the wall this, this, this print, like this retro picture of apparently I think it's supposed to be like their first restaurant with the sign out front, hamburger, 24 cents. Um, we paid a little bit more for that. Funny how things get more expensive over time, right? Yeah, I remember my parents' joy at paying off their home, their $20,000 home that they bought in 1960, the year before I was born. You know, that's back when gasoline was 25 cents a gallon. You could buy a new car for 3000 Things get more expensive over time. It's called inflation. I'm not going anywhere political here, okay. But it has become kind of this, this like universal topic of late. It's right up there with the things you can always talk about, the weather, 
how busy you are over the last 10 years especially. That's everybody talks about how busy they are. And now you can also talk about, have you been to the grocery store lately? Wow, how expensive over the last several years especially. But there's something that's still free. God's grace is still free and always will be. Now, if it wasn't a Lutheran church, I'd say, can I get an amen? Amen. Well, that's the heart of the Christian faith. We are saved by grace. That means gift, totally free gift through faith. That's how we receive it, not by our efforts, not by our works, not by our own blood, sweat, and tears or payment, but totally free. And all the blessings of the kingdom are ours freely given. Forgiveness from God, peace with God, eternal life and the promise, the certain promise of the resurrection, God's presence with us now, his ear to hear our prayers and answer. All of this and more, completely free gifts of our gracious God, and inflation will never touch it. No hidden fees, no payment necessary, no shipping costs, and no tax. Saved by grace, free. Or is it? The truth is that the salvation and life with God that we receive isn't really free at all. Actually, nothing is ever really free because somewhere, somehow, someone has got to pay for it, for it to be free for me. Simple reality. You can't just take something and label it free and make the actual cost go away. The truth is that our salvation, our forgiveness, our eternal life are freely given to us because they were anything but free to Jesus Christ. He paid the cost. He footed the bill. He made the payment so we would never have to. And that's a very good thing because we can't afford it. Not because of inflation. But because the cost of our sin and guilt before the holy God is beyond our ability to comprehend, let alone pay. After all, how much is your eternity worth? So what is the cost? What is the payment that Jesus paid for our forgiveness, for our salvation, for our resurrection, for all of our answered prayers, for all the blessings of heaven that have been given to us for free. What's the cost? What's the payment? That's what this week is all about. Holy Week. By his suffering and death, Jesus has paid the price. By enduring the condemnation we deserve, and we gotta, we got to be square on that, we deserve the condemnation, the judgment. If we don't get that, we're not going to see why what Jesus did is such a big deal. By taking on himself the condemnation and judgment we deserved, he covered the cost. All that we owed because of our guilt before the Father, he has paid in our place. Now, we're about to read the account of the passion of our Lord from the Gospel of Mark. The passion of our Lord in this context means the suffering of our Lord from the Gospel of Mark. The payment was his suffering. And what is that suffering? And normally we think of, we think of, of the suffering of Christ, we think of the suffering on the cross. We think of the, the physical suffering, the pain of the scourging and the, the beating, the agony of being nailed to a cross, nails through your I mean, the excruciating torture of being crucified, one of the most painful, torturous means of torturous death that fallen mankind has invented. I mean, it's hard to even read about or think about it when, I don't know if you've ever seen those descriptions of what it was actually like. It's, it's awful. 
But there's more. There's also the suffering of shame. I might not think about that as much because we're, we are more of a guilt culture than a shame culture. That's North America, Europe, are more of a guilt culture. In a guilt culture, it's, the big question is, am I innocent or not? Am I guilty or innocent? In a, in a shame-oriented culture, it's, am I being dishonored? What do people think of me? Have I brought dishonor on myself, dishonor on my family? And we're still more of a guilt culture than a shame culture, but I do have to say social media is trying to change that. But that's another topic for another time. But the world of the Bible was very much a shame culture. There's so many, you see it so often in the the Psalms and in the prophets, Lord, let me not be put to shame. And there's much in the suffering of Jesus that is all about humiliating and dishonoring him, shaming him by intent. It's not just about putting him to death, it's publicly putting him down dishonoring him with ridicule and mockery for the point that he would never be looked at positively again. Now, what do I mean by the shame that Jesus endured? Well, here's a rundown. The shame of being betrayed by a close friend. The shame of being publicly denied by another friend. The shame of having the men he devoted three years to training, all but one of them, abandoning and running away. The shame of being publicly condemned as a blasphemer by the religious leaders. And the shame of a public beating and mocking in the Sanhedrin chamber. The shame of having his death publicly called for by the crowds. Crucify him, crucify him. The shame of being mocked, ridiculed by the guards and others. The the crown of thorns was all about shame. The purple robe, all about shame. The mocking inscription on the cross, king of the Jews. And the crucifixion itself. It was as much about shame as about pain. It was a form of execution the Romans used just for the worst criminals and slaves who had rebelled. The people they most wanted to dishonor, shame and humiliate, destroy their legacy and people's memories of them. And they did this by hanging them in a prominent public place, roadside intersection, a prominent public place, elevated on a cross, stark naked. Now, I know the artwork and the crucifix always show Jesus in a loincloth. That's just because of people's sense of decency. It wasn't that way. That's not how the Romans did it. No loincloth. It was shaming, absolute shaming and dishonoring. And then the crown of all, shame before the Father. The father who had formerly said, my son whom I love, forsakes him. The father who had said, with him I am well pleased, abandons him. This was all in our place. This was to be for us. This was the cost and suffering and pain and shame that we were to pay for eternity. And this our Savior paid for us. Your Savior paid for you. Why? Because of love. Romans 5, 6 to 8, Paul says it. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, 
Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely would anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ paid the price because of his love for you, for me, for all. Can we even begin to comprehend such love? I mean, you may be willing to undergo all this for somebody you deeply care about, but for the one whose sins put you in that position, the one who betrayed, denied, mocked, and ridiculed, and dishonored you, the ones who shamed you. Yes, love for them. Love for us. Such love. So as we read this passion account, note these two things. How much it cost. The cost of our salvation, including the shame. But note also this. How great the love that bore it all willingly for you and me. But then think also this, how then, how, then, how then do I respond? How then do I thank my Lord for such love? So now we turn to the passion of Christ from the Gospel of Mark. So please take it in hand. And... Um, Sarah will read the parts marked narrator. Sarah, are you reading? Yes. Up, up, up here, please. Yes. I will read the parts of Jesus. There are people in the congregation who are going to read selected parts. They will just stand where they are at the appropriate time and read their lines. But you'll also note that there are parts that are bold, in bold print. Those are groups of people, and we'll all speak them together. This is audience participation. The Passion of Our Lord, according to St. Mark. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. <clears throat> Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room, where may I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left and went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, It is one of the twelve, the one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. 
Truly I tell you today, yes, tonight before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. He said to his disciples, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting enough? The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kissed, man, the rest of the evil way in Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi. Judas then kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion? that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him saying, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days will build another, not made with hands. Yet even then their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed Ghost? I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more answers? You have heard the blessing. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, Rise. And the guards took him and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also with that Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it. Peter went in, out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, This fellow is one of them. 
Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near to Peter said, standing near said to Peter, He began to call down curses, and he swore to them. Immediately, the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. Very early in the morning, the chief priests, with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin reached a decision. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Yes, it is, as you say. The chief priests accused him of many things, so Pilate again asked him, Aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now it was the custom at the feast to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Pilate knew that it was out of envy that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to them. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Crucify him. Why? What crime did he Crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him, and they began to call out to him. Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. They offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, One man ran, fill a sponge, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. 
And when the centurion, who stood there in front of Jesus, heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Younger and of Joseph, and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph brought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Now I invite you to rise as you are able. And we respond to the word by confessing our faith. We use the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended into hell. The third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Um, and have not already done so, please do so now. Also, if you have a prayer request that you'd like included in the prayers, please use the blue card or those of you online, the comments. And then we further reflect on the cost that our Savior willingly bore for us. Amazing grace, how sweet to sound.
our petitions. We come to the Lord with all our needs and all of our thankfulness. And we have a thanksgiving prayer from Scott and Autumn, giving thanks for a successful eye surgery for grandson Eli. And we just prayed about it. So we give thanks to God for answered prayer. Oh Lord, we praise you. Thanks be to God. And from Jerry Schneider, prayer for healing for son uh, Michael, who's suffering from a pinched nerve. So let's pray for relief from his pain. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And from Sue Kelson. It's the prayer for all the leaders of our world. They may work together for peace. Lord, in your mercy. And from Mike and Patty Quinn, prayer for, for Patty's needs, Kathy, who's having cancer surgery on Friday. We commend her to the Lord and pray his blessing upon her blessing through the doctors and nurses. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. I pray for the Lord's blessing on our Holy Week worship this week, on all the services and all who will be taking part. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Of Miss Ellen de Jesus and Francisco as we seek to determine the future of that, of that ministry and for, those, for, the, for the ministry to those people of Mission de Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. And we pray for our Mission India partners, that God may give them faithfulness and steadfastness in the face of persecution. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all the families of St. John's. We name before the Lord this week Tim and Natalie and Tim and Grace Boucher, Bob and Lisa and Gunnar and Soren de Young, Clint and Bev Holtzworth, Russell and Susan Novotny, and Scott and Autumn and Abby Zimmerman. We pray for William Caldwell and his family, for Charlotte Hennessy and her family, and Decker Johansson and their family, and Luca Paliero and his family, and Marvin and Truly Twos and their family. For all the families of St. John's, we lift them to you, Lord, and pray your mercy and blessing upon them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Now our Lord comes to us, not on a donkey, not to palm branch. Our Lord comes to us, comes to us in simple forms of bread and wine, about which he has said, this is my body, this is my blood. He comes to bring us the fruit, the blessing, the result of all that we celebrate this week. Forgive life, peace with Please.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. At your command, Abraham prepared to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice on the mountain, yet in mercy you provided a ram as a substitute. We give you thanks that on Calvary you spared not your only son, but sent him to offer his life as a ransom for many. As we eat and drink the body and blood, grant us, like Abraham, to trust in your promise, now fulfilled in Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke and he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen.
rise as you are able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. His peace be with you. Amen. We pray. O oh God, first of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh. We thank you that for his sake you've given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be constantly enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you Bible classes will be meeting today, and once again, those who want to sing Hallelujah Chorus on Easter, hang around for a practice. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks.